Welcome to the Copper Cycle. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably looking at this and saying, Copper Cycle? What's so important about copper? Well, nothing really. (laughs) That's not really what this lab is about. What this lab is about is something that we call your transfer ability. How can you transfer mass, and can you do it the appropriate way, and can you recover pretty much everything that you're supposed to recover in a lab experiment? That's really what this lab is focused on. We just use copper. One of the reasons it does plenty of different reactions that we can take advantage of. And the second is that it's fairly cheap for us to use and obtain. It seems like we always have copper lying around in the lab. Okay, so with this lab experiment, I first want to kind of delve into the world of general chemistry a little bit. If you're taking 151, this might be a review. If you're not taking 151, or maybe you are taking 151, and your instructor probably just hasn't covered it or won't cover it, who knows? But I want to talk about the different types of reactions that you might get acquainted with over the course of time. So there's five different major ones, one, two, three, four, five. And here are the names that we typically call these five introductory reactions in a general chemistry course. The first one is going to be something called a combustion. Combustion, boom! That's kind of what people think of, even though that doesn't happen every single time. But that is what most people think of when we talk about combust or combusting. Number two is something called a synthesis. All right, so a synthesis basically means to make and I'll talk more about that in just a second. The third one is called a decomposition. All right, so a decomposition reaction, as you can imagine, comes from the word decompose. And what does decompose mean? It's like a decomposing rotting body. Uh, It's going to break down over time, and it's going to change over time, and that's a decomposition reaction. Something is breaking down and decomposing on us. Number four and number five are very similar. Number four is something called a single replacement. And number five is something that's called a double replacement. Okay, so single replacement and double replacement. What are these? They're so similar. I know, I know they are. So bear with me because this is one of the drawbacks of chemistry when we talk about reaction types. A lot of people cannot distinguish the difference between single and double. Well, here's my trick. This is Tracy talk to you, okay? So with our single replacement, and I don't know what that line is. Look, I get so excited talking about types of reactions. These are the things that go on on my screen. All right, so single replacement. Single replacement. Let's say that you are single. (laughs) Ha ha, ding, ding. There we go. Single, single. So you're single and you walk into a bar and there's a couple there. And you look at that couple and you go, hubba, hubba, hey, hey. And part of that couple, they went to the bar very happy. They had no problems in the beginning. They showed up to the bar. They were having a great time. They were drinking. They were laughing. And then they look over at you and one of them has their eyes set on you. And you have your eyes set on them. And you're getting ready to be a home breaker here. You're getting ready to destroy a marriage here. And the reason is because this couple, BC, (laughs) breaks. They get into an argument. They start fighting because they see that one of their eyes is on you instead for the majority of the night. And then you swoop in and take advantage of it. (laughs) Now we get A and C that gives me a product. And then B is broken up with. Boo-hoo-hoo! B gets kicked to the curb and it's out on the street and there's nobody there with it and it's all alone. And you've heard its feelings. So B has to drive home thinking about what just happened that night. This is what we call a single replacement reaction. So what we have is something single that comes into the picture and we have a compound, something that's together and that compound is going to break up. Because this later component, that C, that C is going to look at the new incoming group that's coming in and saying, I'm more attracted to that than I am to B. 
So C breaks up with the B component, and it trottles on over to A and says, hey, do you want to buy me a drink? And A says, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So A and C go together, and they form a new relationship. Now, whether or not that new relationship lasts, that's a different story, but it does form a new relationship for a moment in time. And then poor B is off on its own, but, you know, it can be single for a while. It's Mr. or Mrs. Independent. It's going to be okay. And if something else comes into the picture to make a compound with B, it will go into a relationship. But until that point, it's just going to stay kind of hanging out on its own. And it's going to get its life together. It self-reflects and it tries to improve itself before getting into another relationship. All right, now, the double replacement. Double replacement is kind of similar, but here's the difference. Here we'll have something like AD... And here we'll do uh, B and C. I don't know why I did that. Let me go back. Let me rewrite these. And we'll do A and B together and C and D together. That might make a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Yes! Okay. So A, B, and C, D. So A, B is a couple... And that couple goes to the bar, and they're very happy, and they're laughing, and they're chatting, <laughs> and they're sharing drinks. And then C and D is a couple, and they go into the bar. <laughs> they're having a great time. And then this couple and this couple goes to the same bar, and they begin to sit across from each other, and they begin to drink and laugh and listen to the music and talk about great times. And they begin to have eyes for each other. And these couples are really swingers, and they're going to swing partners. What that means is that A and C will boop, switch places. That's exactly what happens in a double replacement rehab, and that's why we call it a double, because there's a couple here and a couple there. There's two of them. Two couples walk into the bar, and they switch. And they think they're going to have a grand old time. New products are going to form. They leave the bar, and they leave the bar with a brand new relationship than what they showed up with. So instead of A, B, it's now going to be C, B. And instead of C, D, the C is going to get switched out with the A. So those are our two products in what we call the reaction template. That's what we're drawing here, a reaction template. The reason that I did it this way is because if you look, C was written first in that compound, so I want to make sure that I keep it written first in a compound. A was written first in the compound, so I want to make sure that I keep it written first in the compound. B and Ds were written second, and if you look at my products, Bs and Ds are still second. So there is the reaction template for a double replacement. Decomposition, the way that we uh, really like to draw this and represent it, is that I have a compound, and this compound will, of course, break down into the individual components, maybe, that make it up, or at least decomposes in some form or some fashion. So there's the reaction template for decomposition. If I take a look at synthesis, it's the exact opposite. I take two things together, and I make a product baby with it. So A and B are both singles. Those singles go into a club or to a bar. They madly fall in love with each other, which pretty much never happens at a bar. And A and B come together, and they make a couple. And that couple lives happily ever after. The decomposition, we have a couple, and they go into a bar. And while they're at the bar, they begin to fight, and they begin to scream, and they begin to throw stuff, and they begin to accuse each other of doing things that neither one of them did. And then by the end of the night, they have been broken up, and they leave on their own, and they both now are single at this point. So decomposition, that's the way to think about it. So they did not pair up. They did not make a new couple they just left single and sometimes that happens right and then combustion are just the crazy ones combustion really is a little different it takes an organic compound and these are carbon and hydrogen and oxygen based compounds and they react that with o2 and when they do they always form the same product i mean nothing surprising is going to happen here on this side they always form co2 and water 
every single time. That is what a combustion reaction is. So, for instance, if you take butane from the butane lotter, if you smoke real cigarettes, and you lot it up, that butane is going to react with O2 gas, and that's going to produce carbon dioxide and water every single time. And any organic that I put into this spot will always combust and go crazy, and they will always just spew out CO2 and water every single time that they go forward. So the reason that I do this is because, number one, this copper cycle will involve a couple of these different types of reactions. We're going to be focused on decomposition with the copper cycle, and we're also going to be focused on single and double replacements with the copper cycle as well. So you're going to see this as we go through the document and talk about what's getting ready to happen. Decomposition, single replacement, double re replacement are represented very well in the copper cycle lab experiment. Combustion and synthesis, not too much, all right? Uh, these are different types of reactions that we might focus on with a different type of lab experiment, but for this particular one, by far, number three, number four, and number five are represented the most out of everything that we see. All right, so now let me flip back to the lab document. So we've talked about this idea of different types of reactions, and we've also talked about this idea of transfer. That's really what we're going to be focused on here. So we're going to start off with a certain amount of copper, and we're going to undergo reactions with this copper. And in the directions that you're getting ready to see, there's going to be two terms that might show up that you are unfamiliar with, or you might be confused with what really they represent. And that is this term called filtrate and centrate. Filtrate and centrates are basically the liquids that sit above a solid that we want to maybe either keep or get rid of, or the liquid that goes through a piece of filter paper and that is caught down below in some type of container. And that liquid, sometimes we want to keep it and sometimes we want to throw it away. So filtrates and centrates are really the proper terms that go along with that concept. So when we talk about putting something in a centrifuge and centrifuging it down, we get a precipitate at the bottom and we'll have liquid that sits up at the top. Okay, that's going to be called the centrate. If we take a solution that has some solid in it and some liquid, we're going to pour that through a piece of filter paper. The liquid that comes down below is called the filtrate, and the solid stuff will stay up on top of the filter paper. All right, so let's talk about part A. So here's our first reaction that we're going to do with the copper. So step number one is going to say weigh 0.1 or 0.2 grams of copper and place it in a test tube. Record the exact weight. That's very important. I mean, part of this is mass transfer. I should be recording the exact weight. So if I don't record the exact weight in step number one, folks, I've just ruined everything. I'm going to have to go back and redo this whole process all over again just because I simply did not record the mass of the copper that I have used. And that that's really one of the main purposes of the lab. All right, so do not ignore that in step number one. Make sure that you get the exact mass of the copper wire or the pieces of copper that we give you. Number two, in the hood, all caps, that means very important, add concentrated nitric acid. So that's HNO3 right there. Dropwise until copper is dissolved. And then number three, add two mils of water, and the volume can be estimated. You don't need to pipette these. This is all kind of qualitative based, and exact measurements are not necessarily needed. Okay, now when I say that, that means don't just give me a couple of squirts of DI water. You want to be close to two mils as possible. So don't just flood it with water and then turn around and say, well, you told me the volume was not really important. That's not really what I'm saying here, all right? So here in this reaction that you're seeing up here at the top in the center, you're seeing copper solid, which is your piece of copper wire or copper mesh, whatever we decide to give you, is going to react with nitric acid. And these two things are going to come together in your test tube, and these are the product babies that you're going to have from that reaction. And what we're going to be focused on here is we're keeping track of the copper, so this is probably the most important product that I need to focus on in the reaction. All right?
Now, you're seeing these fours and these twos and the twos here. I'll talk about those in just a minute because that's another kind of general chemistry concept that we do need to flesh out a little bit because chances are you might not have seen that either. So I'm not going to drop it, but I'm going to drop it for now. And we'll come back and we'll revisit that in just a few minutes. All right, so there's my reaction. Okay, so after this, it looks like my copper solid, that's why I see the S, is going to go into solution and that nitric acid is going to dissolve it. The reason we say hood is because this is concentrated nitric acid. And folks, I don't want to get this on my skin. I don't want to get it on my clothes. I don't want to breathe in the vapor that this stuff will generate. So you do want to do this under the hood. Don't do it at your lab bench because you're going to stink everybody out of the lab and everybody's going to blame you for not being able to do the lab on time. All right. So now part B. Part B says once you've dissolved this piece of copper, remember we're focused on the copper nitrate piece, it's going to say add 2 mils of dilute sodium hydroxide dropwise with stirring. Add slowly. Okay, let me say that again. Dropwise with stirring, add slowly. Don't just dump it in. There's a reason for that. You'll see that reason in the lab because as you add the drops, you're going to have some observational changes that begin to happen. Those you'll have to record down. Do not add things too fast in this lab. So again, volume doesn't need to be pipetted, but you want to get something close to two mils. Like use a graduated cylinder or something. That would be perfectly fine. Number five, rinse the stirring rod with a minimum amount of deionized water. So you're going to stir it, right? It says drop eyes with stirring. So there's going to be some maybe solid or something on your stirring rod that you want to stay in solution. Ding, 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 ding. Remember, I said mass transfer, and here is part of the problem. We're using a stirring rod, and that stirring rod is going to be dumped down into your solution. And if you are not taking careful steps to make sure that you're keeping everything that needs to be kept, then you're going to start losing product along the way. And that's something that we don't want to happen in this lab. Number six is centrifuge. So you're going to put it in the centrifuge and it's going to spin it around like a washing machine. And then in this test tube, you're going to see some type of solid chunk that's going to be down here at the bottom. And then you're going to see some liquid that sits up at the top. So after we centrifuge it, it says test for complete precipitation with one to two drops of sodium hydroxide. And if no new precipitate is formed, then go to part C. If you do see precipitate, that means the reaction is not complete. So you need to add five more drops of sodium hydroxide, stir it again, rinse the rod like you did before, put it back into the centrifuge, spin it down, and then test the liquid that sits up on top. So when I take this tube out of the centrifuge, I'm going to tick, tick, Add some drops of sodium hydroxide, and I hope that no precipitate is going to form at this point. If it does not form, then that's good. I'm cleared out, and I can then go to part C. If I do see precipitate, that means I didn't add enough sodium hydroxide in the beginning, so I need to add more sodium hydroxide, and I need to spin it down once more, and then I need to retest it to see if all the precipitate is now finally out. If you do not get all of the precipitate out of here in this step, ding, 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 that's an alarm as well. And the reason is because that is copper that you will be losing throughout the process. You have to make sure that all of the precipitation is out. All right, so next, part C. If I go back up to part B, we're going to have product babies, and one of those product babies is the copper hydroxide. All right. So again, that's the copper piece. That's the copper piece I want to track. So now we're going to take this copper hydroxide and look at this. It's going to decompose almost in a way, right? I've got this one compound and it breaks apart into two, CuO and H2O. So I'm going to take copper two hydroxide that breaks down into copper two oxide and water. So it tells me to place this test tube that I get out of the centrifuge and put it into a hot water bath and stir it until the precipitate turns black. And then I'm going to rinse the stirring rod again with Diana's water. And then I'm going to put it back in the centrifuge and I'm going to discard the centrate and in parentheses we put liquid there for you. 
So at this point, we don't need the liquid anymore. This is all trashy stuff that we can dump down the sink, and we're going to keep the solid precipitate instead. Now, the key here is centrifuge. You've just taken it out of a hot water bath. You're putting it in a centrifuge, and when you do this, that hot water bath is going to make the test tube hot, and that hot test tube is going to go in a centrifuge and spin down really fast, and there's going to be a temperature different change, a fluctuation that begins to happen. This is bad news, and the reason it's bad news is because it can crack your test tubes. And if you crack the test tubes, folks, that means you're going to have to start all the way up at part A. You've just lost everything, and you can't recover it. So this is going to be a star step, and the reason is because this is a problem area, because people rush it, and because they rush it, their test tubes break. All right, part D. Now, back up to part C. I'm generating copper oxide, right? So in part D, we're going to take that copper oxide, and this time we're going to add hydrochloric acid to it. So hydrochloric acid, copper oxide goes in, two couples walk into a bar, the couples switch partners, the Cu and the H switch places. So now we have a CuCl compound, and we have an H and an H and an O compound, which is H2O. So I'm going to add acid, and the precipitate is going to dissolve, and it says a green solution should form. And then number four, make sure you rinse that stirring rod again with as little water as possible that you can incorporate into the system. All right, so keep it clean, keep the transfers going, and you'll be okay for this part. So here we formed copper 2 chloride, and again we're focused on the copper. So in part E, we're going to take this copper 2 chloride, and in this case, we're going to add stinky ammonia hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide is almost like cat pee for the lab. Okay, that's how bad it stinks. So when you crack open the cap to an ammonium hydroxide bottle, again, everybody will know it because that's how stinky this stuff is. Once more... Use the hood whenever you use concentrated ammonium hydroxide. The good news is that in this lab, we're using a weakened version, a dilute version of ammonium hydroxide. Now, that means this is still stinky, but it's not as bad as what it is coming out of the bottle. So number 15 says transfer that solution from up above into a 250 ml beaker, rinse the test tube out twice, with distilled water. Ding, 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 ding. All right, there's a transfer step. So we want to make sure that we transfer everything out of the tube as possible. So we're going to rinse it twice, and we're going to dump that into a beaker so that way we can save it. And number 16 says we're going to add ammonium hydroxide, stinky stuff, one milliliter at a time, very slowly, until precipitate dissolves. And a deep blue, almost purple solution results. So there's two different reactions that are going on here. As I add ammonium hydroxide first, I'm generating this first reaction until we get to a pH of 9 or a little bit higher. And when pH of 9 goes, it's going to take copper to hydroxide that I don't want because this is a reagent or a product that we had from up above. So I don't really want or I'm not really interested in that. So I'm going to continue to add sodium or ammonium hydroxide to this reaction until we get a copper complex. So that's why it says until a deep blue, almost purple solution results. This is a two-stepper and the second step does not happen until you go above a pH of a 9. So we know we are above a pH of a 9 if we see that deep, deep blue solution that begins to form. All right, so here I've got this copper complex, and part F is going to have me to take the copper complex, add ammonium hydroxide that could be left over. If you look at this direction, you're going to see that this direction doesn't tell you to add any extra. But that ammonium hydroxide that I just added in, probably some excess, with some sulfuric acid, and this sulfuric acid is a dilute solution. I'm going to add those together, 
and I'm going to get copper sulfate as a product, baby. All right, so add dilute 3 molar or 6 normal sulfuric, and we'll get a interim precipitate, and that will disappear. And you'll get this very light Carolina blue color. So it goes from that deep, deep blue purplish color from part, um, uh, the part above to a very light Carolina blue color here in this part. And then finally, number 18 says we're going to then add an extra milliliter of acid. We just want to make sure it's acidic after this point. All right, now part G, which is our last part. We have this copper sulfate that's in my solution, in my tube, in my beaker, whatever I have it in. And that copper sulfate, we're then going to add metal to it. And that metal is going to be magnesium. So here we have magnesium, which is single. And this single, sexy magnesium goes into the bar, goes into the club, and it says, hey, give me a drink, bartender. And it sits up at the bar, and it drinks all evening long, and in comes a couple of copper sulfate. And copper sulfate gets along great. There's no problems. But when copper sulfate came in, this sulfate piece says, oh, uh, magnesium, where have you been all of my life? And that magnesium and that sulfate, Makes a product, baby. There's a new couple, and that couple leaves the bar, and this copper, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, all the way home, because now it's single. Well, this copper, folks, is precipitating out because it's not bonding up with anything else. This is now just pure old copper all alone, just as it was from the very beginning. And you will start to see copper metal precipitate out at this step. So in order to do this, number 19 says add a small amount of magnesium or zinc dust, either one of these will work, until gas stops. Number 20, add one dropper full of sulfuric. And you want to look for gas formation here. If there's no gas and the solution's clear, you're done. No more steps. If there's no gas but the solution is still blue, then you need to go back up to number 19 and add a little bit more magnesium. Well, if there's gas and you stir it until the evolution stops, evolution of the gas, then you're going to repeat number 20. So if you add one dropper full of sulfuric acid and you see gas that gets generated, that means you keep letting it do its thing, keep letting it churn, keep looking at the bubbles, and then you go back up to number 20 and add another drop full of sulfuric acid and see if more gas forms. You are not done with this step until you see no gas. That is what we're after here in this step. Number 21, when you're finished with that, there's no gas that's getting generated. The solution's clear. You will see your copper metal in that solution. So we now have to filter it. So we're going to weigh a piece of filter paper. Again, very important. We're going to filter that solution through the filter paper, and the copper is going to stay on top. And then we allow that precipitate to dry on the filter paper. Now, a lot of people will say, can I put this in the oven? And the answer is, yeah, you can put it in the oven. Uh, the problem, though, is that copper does tend to oxidize if you do not completely rinse off all the acid. If you do not take care of that copper, it will change and it will no longer be copper anymore. It will be a copper compound after this point. So the safest thing here, number one, rinse it extremely well with DI water. Okay, that is going to be the number one thing. You got to get rid of all of this acid that you've just put that solution in. Okay, and then number two, we prefer to dry it, but we prefer this to stay in your lab bench. And the reason is because this prevents maybe some of the hotter temperatures or the heat to attack the copper and maybe form uh, copper compounds such as like copper oxide maybe again or just rust. Who knows what that oven's going to do with it with the temperature, especially if you've not rinsed it very well. Okay. 
All right, so there's kind of the breakdown of the lab. It's just a couple of different directions. A couple of reagents get added in. And once more, we're focused on your percent recovery. So to report percent recovery, what we do is we take the amount that you ended up with. So after the product has been dried and you can weigh it, subtract your filter paper weight from it. That's how much copper you've ended up with. And we're going to take our starting amount of copper that we measured out from the very first step. We take the two and divide them. Okay, it's a proportion. It's a ratio. And because it's percentage, we want to multiply by 100. So what we're after here is something that's not extremely low. Like if you're down at 20% range, we're going to go, oh gosh, you're horrible. You need to go back and maybe do it again because 20%, you've lost 80% of the copper. I mean, think of each little percentage of copper as money that you have just dumped down the drain because that's kind of what it is. Only 20% recovery you didn't let the reactions go to completion. You didn't rinse out your tubes and rinse off your stirring rods. Something happened along the way to make you lose too much. Well, if you're way over, like 120%, you're going to look at this and go, hey, look at me, I did really good, I got 120. And I'm going to go, no, that's not good. And the reason that's not good is because you can't make more than what you started with. How did you make more copper than what you started with in the very beginning? That doesn't make any sense. So typically what happens on the high ends is that you have made some type of compound. You have made a copper, and I'm going to put an X here, because there's a couple of things that you could have made compound-wise. Well, if that's the case, this is added weight because this is a compound. It's not just copper. So you have added additional weight into the system in some form or fashion, and that's why you have a percent yield or percent recovery greater than 100%. Additionally, what could also happen here is water weight. Water is typically a problem for people that are very impatient because copper needs to fully dry, and your filter paper needs to fully dry as well. And if it's not fully dry, this is extra weight, and that extra weight is going to skew your numbers off as far as the recovery goes. Now, I didn't forget about the reactions. All right, so I want to kind of go through and tell you a little bit about what those big numbers represent in the uh, reactions or in the equations. So what I want to do is kind of go to maybe a, a problem here. This is number two. Balance the following equations. So H2O2 and H2O. That's where I want to start. All right, so H2 and O2 gives me H2O. Well, first, what type of reaction is this? Well, you're going to look at this and say, there's something and there's something. And it's just H on its own. It's just O on its own. And they go in and they make me some water babies. Uh, it looks like we're taking two things and we're making one out of it. So this is kind of like a synthesis reaction here. Okay. So this reaction is what we call not balanced. And what that means is that if we look at the left and look at the right-hand side, there's different numbers. So this hydrogen over here to the left-hand side, there's just two of those, all right? So there's two hydrogens there. And the oxygen count, that oxygen count, there's two of those. That's what those subscripts mean down below. Well, over here on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, uh, how many hydrogens do I have? Well, there's a two that immediately follows it. So there's two hydrogens. And then there's an oxygen. So how many oxygens do I have? Well, there's just one because there's not a subscript there. It's understood to be a one if there's nothing written. So here we have violated the law of conservation of mass. And this is probably something that you've talked about in Chem 151 if you've taken it so far. If not, welcome to the law of conservation of mass. So basically what this means is that the stuff that I start with has to be the stuff that I end up with. I can't really lose stuff, and I can't really make stuff up. I mean, the amount of hydrogens and oxygens in the beginning, it has to be the same amount of hydrogen and oxygen in the end. And it looks like the oxygen numbers here are kind of wonky. They're not matching. I need everything to match. So this is how we fix it. What I do is I add in coefficients. 
And this coefficient, I look at this O and there's one, and I look at that oxygen and there's two. I can't break up compounds, okay? That violates the rules. The only thing you can do is write numbers in front of the entire compound or element. So it looks like, oh, okay, I need this side to have two. So the way that I kind of fix that is I'll put a big two out in front. And then this gives me two oxygen because that two goes to that oxygen because that's part of the compound. So this gives me two oxygens now. And then this gives me two oxygens on the left. And they match. And I think I'm done. Mm -mm. Wrong. And the reason is because the two also goes to the hydrogen as well. It goes to everything in the compound. So two times two is four hydrogens on the right-hand side. So by doing that, I have now changed the total number. How, wait, what? What? Okay, let me say that again. Each water molecule carries two hydrogens. I've just now doubled it. That's what the two means in front. So if it already had two, and now I've doubled that amount, well, two times two is four. So I've got four total hydrogens on the right. Over here to the left... Well, I have two that doesn't match anymore, so I need to fix it. Well, how do I fix it? Well, I can put a big two here in front, and that two times two is four, and this gives me four hydrogens, and two times two is four hydrogens on the right, and this gives me two oxygens on the left, and this also gives me two oxygens on the right. So everything is balanced at this point. And we call this a balanced chemical equation. So when you go through and take a look at these reactions that the lab experiment's giving you, that is why some of these have big fat numbers out in front, and those numbers are coefficient values that make the equation balanced. All right, so now let's take a look at another one, shall we? Let's look at B. It's sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. All right, so let me clear out the screen, and we'll do another example. H2SO4 and NaOH gives me something. All right, so what does it give me? Well, this reaction says water and Na2SO4. All right, so water and Na2SO4. Okay, so how do we do this? We do it just like the one before. So over here to the left, I have a hydrogen, right? And there's two from right there, H2, but don't forget about this one. There's a third one right there, so there's three. All right, so three hydrogens in total on the left-hand side. All right, so there's our first step. It also looks like I have sulfur. Sulfur, there's no coefficient, no subscript there, so there's a one sulfur. Next is oxygen, I have four from there. And I look over here, NaOH, there's an extra one there. So there's a total of five. Uh, the Na, the Na is a new one. I've not written that one down yet. So there is a one. So a one to the left. The oxygen we've already taken care of. And the hydrogen we've already taken care of. So here are the totals over on the left-hand side. Now let's kind of match that with the right-hand side. Okay, so hydrogen. I have two from water. And I don't really see anything else other than that one. So two hydrogens, okay, they're not matching. I know this equation is not balanced. Then I go to the oxygen. I see one. And then the sulfate piece, there's four more. So this is going to be a total of five. Okay, well, that matches. Five oxygen to the left, five oxygen to the right. Ding, ding, that works. Then I go to the sodium. And it looks like Na2SO4. So there's two sodiums over on the right-hand side. And there's only one to the left. <clears throat> That's wrong. And then my next one is the sulfur. And there's one to the left. And there's one to the right. So ding, ding, that matches. And the other oxygens we were already taken care of. So it looks like our biggest problem here is sodium that needs to be matching. Uh, the oxygen matches. The sulfur matches. And the hydrogens need to match. All right, so let's start with the sodiums first. That might be a little easier. So sodium here, I have a two right there. And this sodium, there's only one. So what I do is I bring in a coefficient. So I'll put a big two out in front. There we go. So this changes my number now to a two. So two sodium and two sodium. Okay, well, those match. But the problem is that this two goes to that sodium, 
but that two also goes to that oxygen and that two also goes to that hydrogen. So by doing that, it has changed my total oxygen and hydrogen content. So now I've got to go back and I've got to rework it. I know it's a pain, but that's what we have to do. So this looks like there's four oxygens to the left, plus now another two from the NaOH piece. So four plus two is going to be a total of six. And then the hydrogen content, there's two there. And then this has brought in now another two, which two plus two is going to be a four. So it's changed that number as well. All right, so that's the problem that incorporating that coefficient or the in front has done. So it's changed my sodium, which was good. It changed my hydrogen, which didn't match anyway, so that really didn't matter. And it changed my oxygen, which was bad because they were matching, but now they're not. All right, so I'm going to go back, and now I just kind of need to take a look at how do I need to fix this problem. So oxygen six, and that oxygen is five. I need another oxygen over here on this side. How can I get another oxygen? Well, I, I just need one more, just one more to make a match, and that's just the random one that I picked. Well, this oxygen has four. The problem here is that if I put a two here in front, well, that's going to double the four, which makes it an eight. Okay, I just can't simply add one there. That's not going to fix my problem. But I could put a two here. And in doing that, I did have one, but now I have an extra one because I put a two out in front. Okay, so I go back and I recount my oxygen. It looks like there's going to be two oxygens now and then another four from here. So that's going to be a total of six. Oh, thank goodness, because that's exactly what I needed to the left. There were six of them. But in doing that, I've also changed my hydrogen count, but these weren't matching anyway, right? So maybe, just maybe, by putting a two there, I've kind of fixed that problem too, and I've killed two birds with one stone. So let's check it. Two times two is four from here, and I don't really see any more anywhere else on this side of the reaction. So now I have four hydrogens in total. Ding, 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 ding. That's what we need. So now look at this. The hydrogen has four on the left, and it now has four on the right. My sulfur has one on the left, and it now has one on the right. The oxygen has six on the left, and it now has six on the right. And my sodium now has two on the left, and my sodium has two on the right. Everything matches at this point. Again, two hydrogens from here plus another two is four, and on this side, two times two is four. The sulfur, I have one, and on this side, I have one. The oxygen, I have four plus another two, which is a total of six, and on this side, there's two plus another four, which is a total of six. The sodium, I have two of them. Here, I have two. The oxygen, we've already balanced and the hydrogen we've already balanced. So folks, this is an introduction onto how to balance a chemical reaction. And I hope those two examples kind of make sense. Um, this is typically the type of lecture material that's included in a general kind of chemistry class, uh, but it is somewhat relevant here because these lab directions do start plastering all of these reactions in front of you with all of these big numbers out in front. And a lot of times, if people have not had a chemistry class before, or maybe they have had a chemistry class and they just had a sucky teacher, if that was the case, they have no clue what those big numbers are or how it even got there. And this is the one of the reasons that they are present. All right, so good luck in the copper cycle. I hope that this gives you a fleshed out kind of idea of what we want you to do here and have fun with it, right? I mean, that's what this is all about, kind of. Go into the lab, take some copper, dissolve it up, see some pretty colors, and then in the end, get the copper back to prove to yourself that you've not lost anything throughout the reaction schemes. And then hopefully you can provide us a pretty good percent yield or percent recovery. All right, so good luck in the lab. We'll see you there. Don't forget to complete the pre-lab assignment that goes along with this assignment. And we'll be ready for you when you show up. If you got questions, you know how to get a hold of us. Talk to you later.